I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about schools of education. Margaret Krakow is Dean of the University of Iowa College of Education, the first college-level Department of Education in the United States. Margaret is author or co-author of eight books, including Learning to Teach in an Age of Accountability. Margaret previously served as Chair of the Department of Arts and Humanities at Teachers College, Columbia University. Richard Vetter is Distinguished Professor of Economics at Ohio University and Director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. Rich is author or co-author of six books, including Going Broke, Going Broke by Degree, Why College Costs Too Much. He recently argued on the PBS NewsHour that the cost of college is rising relative to the benefits of college. Welcome to both of you. Glad to be with you. Well, oh, thanks for coming. Margaret, if I could start with you. Um, what is the purpose of a school of education? Yeah. Why do we have schools of education? Colleges of education have developed historically to prepare professionals to work in education. Uh, and education needs to be understood in all of its manifestations. I think when people think about colleges of education, they focus on the preparation of teachers. But in fact, we do much more than preparing teachers. We prepare leaders. We prepare principals and superintendents. We prepare individuals who work in counseling psychology. We prepare people who will focus on education sometimes in the workforce, in healthcare settings. So there are a range of things. Every university does it somewhat differently in terms of how those are organized. But colleges of education really want to give uh, the proper understanding and depth to what we would expect of those who are moving into a, prepar into a profession. And so I'd say that's why we've evolved towards colleges of education, schools of education, to get at the depth that's needed for this profession. And, and Rich, do you think we should have more schools of education, fewer schools of education? Do you have an opinion on, on, on how they're developing? Yes, I do have an opinion. Uh, by the way, my, both my wife and my son both have doctorates from schools of education, so I, I, I have nothing conceptually against schools of education. I think that we need training in the kinds of things that schools of education do. The issue is one of, of perspective and proportionality. And I am increasingly of the opinion that uh, certainly undergraduate education should be in subject matter material mainly and secondarily in what we might be called pedagogical uh, preparation. Maybe at the graduate level there is rooms for some schools of education. If my recommendation were followed, that is to say if I were czar, uh, which I thank God I'm not, for a lot of people would agree, uh, I, I think we would cut down substantially on schools of education in the United States. If I might jump in there, I think this is an area in which I would agree with what Richard has just said. And I would venture to say many people working in colleges of education also believe that uh, there are too many colleges of education and that we have to focus on those that do an excellent job. I think um, most of us also believe that subject matter knowledge needs to be a, a, a key focus, not an exclusive one. Mm -hmm. But for example, at the University of Iowa, our students all major in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences as they work their way towards certification. So I, th I think that there is actually a growing consensus among many of uh, those of us who lead colleges of education that, that there is some change that's needed in that regard. Well, you mentioned schools that aren't excellent. I mean, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Is, it, is an education dean going to say, well, we're not excellent? I mean, how are we going to determine who's excellent and who's not? Yeah. Well, I think that that's a very good question, and it's one that some of the accrediting agencies are trying to come to terms with. I know that in the federal government, there's some consideration around this. Uh, Arne Duncan spoke at Teachers College, for example, when I was on the faculty there, and, and made it very clear that in uh, his view, there needs to be some winnowing of colleges of education. You're right, no college of education dean is going to put themselves out of business unilaterally. So I think as a society uh, in higher ed, we have to think about what are the standards that need to be non-negotiable in terms of the training of those for careers in the profession of education and um, in insist that those uh, criteria are widely uh, followed and respected and, and that may produce some change. 
do, but do we make rich rich vetter the czar of that? And do, do we have rich be the determin the person who determines whether or not we close college edu education college of education X or Y? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the interesting features of American education generally, whether we're talking K through 12 or higher ed, is that because we're situated in a democracy, these kinds of d decisions have always been as a result of discussions among various sectors. And if in your, you're in a public university, obviously you're working hand in glove with the state about what they require of future teachers. So I think it is ap absolutely necessary that there be professional expertise, that there's research brought to bear about what works and doesn't work, and various groups in the federal government and at the state level and in universities are trying to build that body of knowledge. Um, but I do think ultimately it will have to be a conversation among various sectors to make those determinations. I'm in a shocking position where I'm agreeing with most of what a dean of a college of education <laughs> says, which is a very rare be careful, uh, this yeah, is on the yeah, record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, just for the sake of a little diversity of mm -hmm. discussion, I, I quite agree that in a, a pluralistic democracy, it takes multiple uh, forces, multiple different peoples and groups to make assessments about uh, public policy. And, and, and having schools of education is ultimately an issue, mostly of public policy, even though some of the, a few of the schools, so great ones, including Teachers College, are private, or the University of Pennsylvania. But at the same time, having said that, uh, looking at some of the organizations that actually do a lot of this stuff today, uh, some of the accreditation agencies. There's a group called NCATE. I don't know, have any idea what it stands for. Uh, Margaret does, I'm sure. That I think for the most part has over the years flubbed their responsibilities with respect to in, in, in inculcating quality control into the, into the area. Having said that, I would say the same thing could be said of many other accrediting agencies in other areas besides education, but the accreditation pro process is not working as it should. Well, but how should we train? Let's, let's, let's follow up on, on, on your reasoning there, Rich. I mean, if, if, so if, if, if the accrediting is not working and we have schools, schools of education that aren't working, how should we deal with p teachers in those places Perhaps, and we might need teachers in those places, perhaps they're rural areas, perhaps they're places where a lot of people aren't going to respond to the market forces. How do we get teachers there and how do we know that the teachers are competent? I don't know that we have a serious problem, teacher short, I, 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 and I live in a rural area where there, there are different kinds of problems than you have in urban areas and our nation is diverse and so the teacher shortage versus surplus problem varies uh, in, dramatically across the country. Having said that, though, I think if we had a world, for example, where we said no person can receive a teaching certificate without a subject matter degree, I'm just, this is just, this is sort of a sledgehammer approach, but it might be one that one might put in, and I could see that happening within a few years in our country. If that were to happen, would there be a problem of getting teachers in other areas? I don't think so. I really don't think so. And I also think colleges are entrepreneurial enough that they would rise quickly to the challenge and offer in some cases some graduate work or supplementary work that fulfills some of the things that are legitimate functions of colleges of education at the, perhaps at the graduate level or as a short course uh, uh, stuff in the summers and so forth that would turn English majors into teachers or whatever it might be. Yeah. One thing I would add to that is that, you know, we know that there are certain areas where there is an oversupply of teachers. Elementary education majors or elementary education teachers, we have more than we need in a sense. But of course, one always wants to say that what we need are excellent elementary teachers. Um, we need excellent English teachers. Uh, the field that I taught in social studies, we have an oversupply there as well. But there are certain areas, math and science in particular, where there is a distinct 
huge shortage of teachers, uh, whether in urban areas or in rural areas. And, and as I think Richard's pointing out, some of this is the distribution of teachers nationwide. It is very hard to get teachers to teach in the rural areas. It's not so hard sometimes to get them to teach in the urban areas, but to have them stay teaching in the urban areas is a, a huge problem. So I think we have to be creative as, as institutions of higher education, the states, the federal government, in how to incentivize individuals to come out of uh, math and science careers, perhaps, and go into teaching those areas. I mean, one of the things that we know that speaks to this issue of the, the kind of major that someone preparing to teach takes is that deep subject matter knowledge will contribute very much. You know, a certain percentage of, of the difference in terms of how your students perform is uh, encapsulated by that deep subject matter knowledge. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And we know that having what we call in the trade pedagogical content knowledge, understanding how to take the concepts of science and teach them effectively so that students learn, knowing what misconceptions students bring to the classroom so that as a teacher I can head them off at the pass, if you will, um, through the pedagogical approaches that I select to teach that material. All of that speaks to the need not just to have subject matter knowledge, but to understand what to do with that so that there's the effective transmission and, and engagement of students with a subject area. Uh, may I jump in here a little bit? I agree, uh, I, I agree with what Margaret said generally. But there is, and she used the word incentivize. There are a lot of problems in higher ed that are no faults whatsoever of the colleges of education that prevent a lot of this from happening. For example, why don't we pay math teachers $10,000 a year or whatever the appropriate amount would be, more than social science, social studies, uh, uh, humanities type teachers, English uh, teachers for example. Elementary, why don't we pay uh, special ed and math teachers more than elementary school teachers? Why don't we do it? Will you talk to the teachers unions? They say no. So there are other institutional factors at work. In, in, in that have to be addressed if we truly want education reform as part of the package here. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think that's another part of the, uh, another issue. Do you think we should pay math teachers more? Uh, if, if that's what it takes to get math teachers, yes. I've written this for years. And uh, I've been, I was once asked, were our teachers in America underpaid? And uh, I said no, which of course immediately had a thousand, uh, I got a thousand emails from union reps and so forth. But I said they're mispaid. Some of them are underpaid. Some of them are doing heroic work. And uh, this is quite aside from the issue of merit. This is quite aside from the issue of good versus bad. This issue does not enter into the, higher, into the education equ equation in America. It's shameful. Uh, it relates to what the College's education does, but it's also independent of it. I would just add to that uh, that the state of Iowa has just introduced a new teacher pay proposal. Um, we're not quite sure if that, you know, where that's going to land, but there's a lot of interesting reform that's going on education-wise in the state of Iowa. And so the proposal that's on the table would move away from the classic career ladder pay scheme and look at uh, areas of expertise, you know, how you document that, how you determine who a master teacher is. Um, all of that can be problematic from a measurement standpoint. But I think that there are some state-by-state state experiments, you know, some innovations that are going on to, to to address some of these issues. Well, and speaking of those issues, what about issues of accrediting a math teacher? Are there alternative ways of perhaps accrediting who, who can teach math? Yeah, we've, again, in the state of Iowa, there has been an initiative around this over the last several years of an alternative path to accreditation that the University of Northern Iowa, Iowa State, and the University of Iowa all collaborated on, which I think is a, you know, a nice model mm -hmm. in and of itself, but with the idea of bringing more STEM teachers in particular into the pipeline in Iowa. And so um, there you know, has been some movement, and New Jersey, for example, for a long time has had an alternative root program that is allowed, I, I think, you know, for quite a sizable number of people coming out of business and industry to teach in those areas. So I think, again, on a state-by-state -state basis, we're seeing some experimentation with new models. And a lot of these alternative certification approaches are working very well. I'm not saying they are all working well, and it obviously varies from individual to individual. Uh, 
personal experience, if I may. My own son, who graduated uh, uh, with a two master's degree, Phi Beta Kappa, as well as a bachelor's degree. Uh, my daughter, who graduated from Northwestern University with a degree, both began teaching without one scintilla of, of coursework of any kind, preparation, in teaching pedagogy or anything in the Atlanta area because they were desperate for teachers. My son won the Teacher of the Year Award in his first year. Now, both of them have gone on, my son to even get a doctorate in education, uh, and they did pick up the, the, some of the, that, that work, and some of it was very valuable for them. But the point is that we should be a little more open than we have been to alternative paths to becoming teachers, and we just need to do that. Which, which brings me to the point about Teach for America. Uh, Margaret, I, I believe mm -hmm. you've been on the record as, mm -hmm. as being, not, uh, being opposed to some mm -hmm. of the work that Teach for America is doing. And mm -hmm. it seems to me, from where I'm sitting, that Teach for America is uh, you know, a viable path and a reasonable path for a lot of kids and a lot of school districts. Why are you opposed to Teach for America? Yeah, I, I would say perhaps um, my view is a little more nuanced than to say that it, it's strictly opposed to it. I have concerns about it, I think, is probably the best way to characterize my point of view on this. Uh, I, I have to credit uh, what Wendy Kopp has done for sure in terms of bringing in people to teaching and education who probably wouldn't have been interested in teaching were it not for Teach for America. It is a powerful marketing machine. They do a wonderful job in terms of their vetting of those who are coming into teaching. So there are some good things and I think you know, we can learn from some of those things. Nonetheless, what we know is that the uh, vast majority of those who go through Teach for America stay only two years. It is the minority who persist. And when we know that they are teaching in Newark or in New York or in uh, New Orleans for that matter and staying such a short time and that their performance um, during the two years that they are teaching is not at the level of those who have come in with certification. Um, and, and over time they catch up um, and in fairness even exceed in some ways the performance of regularly certified teachers in mathematics. Uh, this is to me a giant social experiment with our poorest and the most needy students that this constant cycling of new teachers in is not something that is in the long term best interests educationally of the most vulnerable populations of school children in our country. So in that sense, I have, have concerns to the degree that it has been adopted by policymakers and you know, some of those in this town as a, uh, an approach to the problems of ur urban education uh, and the need to attract good teachers. I, but all, again, all that said, I want to be clear that in opposing this um, or having concerns about it, I don't want to say that I don't value the idealism that brings so many young people in to Teach for America. I think that's one thing that is really wonderful, that there is this outlet for people who want to make a difference. I just wish more of them, and th this is what I've said when I've been interviewed, I wish more of those who started in Teach for America would stay with teaching. I think then we're talking about real change in places like Newark and New Orleans. And I think you're probably, that's a fair comment, but let's, let's play that out if you don't mind me pressing you on this a little bit. Sure. I mean, if there is, let's say there's a teacher who recently graduated the University of XYZ, and now they're in Teach for America, and they develop some relationships with a group of students in New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, for that year, those kids have now permanently been affected by that young, idealistic, energetic teacher. Now, perhaps it would be better if that teacher were to stay for a longer period of time. That's true. But what's wrong with that great experience of those kids and that teacher in that year? No, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it, but, but when you're saying that if the option, as happened in New Orleans, where the, you know, the idea was to go with Teach for America recruits as opposed to bringing in certified teachers, you know, that, that it, it's not that anything that the TFA recruit is doing is, is, is bad or, or harmful in a sense, although, again, we know that it's, it's the comparison with what might have been had that student had a certified teacher in those two years. So it's, it's not the difference between bad and good, it's the difference perhaps between good and better. And I want to see that the, our, the students that need uh, these kinds of strong educational experiences get it consistently in the absolutely optimal way. Well, uh, I agree it's 
an empirical issue to some extent. Do Teach for America products perform as well or not as well in the classroom, even in their short one, two year tenure, as do a, a traditionally trained teachers? That is an important empirical question. Margaret uh, spoke to that and she cited uh, suggestions that in some cases they don't perform as well. I'm questioning, I don't know the answer to that, but I think we need to do a serious national study on that to verify that. I've never met a dean of education that didn't hate Teach for America, or in a more nuanced way like Margaret is. I like Margaret, she's my favorite education dean instantly. Uh, in a more nuanced way, at least has serious reservations about it. Uh, uh, competition is good, and competition, new ways of doing things is, is good, and we need that. And if the problem is too many Teach for America people give up after two years, we might ask the question, why is that? Why is it that these very bright, energetic, idealistic people feel that the teaching profession is something we want to avoid as a long-term commitment? Why isn't it? And I think some of it goes back to some other things I mentioned earlier, merit pay and uh, things of that nature, some of the union rules, the bureaucracy and so forth, it stifles innovation and continuation uh, amongst many of these people. And the only footnote I would add to that is that it's very interesting when you look cross-culturally at teaching. Because if you look at Japan, or if you look at Korea, or if you look at Finland, places that are you know, often mentioned as having a very different approach to teacher preparation, um, you know, what we see there is that a very small number, a percentage rather, of those who apply to be teachers are actually selected to be teachers. They tend to stay in teaching. It is a highly prestigious uh, occupation. They're paid better, relatively speaking, than teachers in the United States are. Um, I, I would concede that there are probably some structural issues that um, we need to address in this country to make long-term teaching more attractive, but I do think there is a fundamental cultural issue, socio-cultural issue, about the status of teaching in this country, all of which, of course, those things are intertwined. Um, and, and there might be some short-term modifications one can make, but the longer-term issue of just how we position teaching in uh, this society is one that's going to take, I think, a sea change in order to uh, see the kind of profile that we see in a place like Finland. Well, we only have a few minutes to create the sea change, so I'm going to ask if, just quickly if I could ask both of you, what proposals would you make to make our schools of education better and to help create that sea change? Mm -hmm. Well, jokingly, I once told a legislature and horrified a lot of people that I would make it a felony for a school superintendent to hire a graduate of a college of education. What I really meant by that is, I think, just as a very beginning first step, is we should move away from the notion that a baccalaureate degree should be in, in education, should be a primary uh, a, a approach, the, the, the preferred approach, the conventional approach for teacher education. That would be a nice first step would not be my only step, but where I'm sure short of time, and Margaret is, is, is I, I can see, eager to jump into this discussion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, but I, I think, Richard, actually, there are, have been many changes along those lines yeah, there um, have. that have already there, in there many, have, many yeah. states, and perhaps we need more, but, but I think we're moving down that path. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we, we need to be honest about as deans of colleges of education is that we, I think, need to be more selective in terms of who we allow to come into our programs. You know, even elementary education, and I say that because I think there's a stereotype out there about elementary teachers, but when you think of the knowledge demands for an elementary school teacher, that they need to know math and science, they need to be good at English language arts, and of course they need to know something about the history of our country. I don't want us to forget that public education is in fact about citizenship. Uh, you know, that the knowledge demands of being an elementary teacher cannot in any way be under Underestimated. So it's, I, I think that we need to raise the bar in terms of what we do. If I can quickly jump in there, there's been studies out recently that says the average grade point average of College of Education graduates is off the wall, 3.7, 3.8. 
other parts of the university much, much lower. This is, an, this is the fault of the colleges of education, and it is an area where they can raise the bar. It's not the only area where they can raise the bar, but it's a sign. We want to treat this, if they truly want to be treated as a revered profession, they've got to do what people in other revered professions do. They've got to show the accomplishment, and, and there has to be a higher standard set. Well, speaking of accomplishments, you both are very accomplished and both great speakers and both forcefully presented your points, so thank you both for coming on to the show today. If you would like additional information about the Center for College Affordability or the University of Iowa College of Education, please visit centerforcollegeaffordability.org or education.uiowa.edu. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>